over to you guys, and I'm going to sit back and be on a panel now. <laughs> Double duty here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll keep it in the family. Thank you, Darren. It's great to see you all. Probably 50% of you were here last year. It's really great. This has become like a family reunion. Um, I should say that Mallory is really the kind of lead on all of this. I just follow her lead, and she just got me here this morning, and she's going to be doing some of the panels as we, g as we go through the day. But I'm now going to say, Mallory, why don't you take a seat and relax, <laughs> and we'll kick off the show. <laughs> so anyway, let's see. So those of you that came last year may remember that this is it's a little bit like Groundhog Day. We kicked off last year with a panel discussion that Mallory hosted with Mayor Russ and um, Roman from um, Commune, in which we talked about how LA was starting to be recognized by global cities li like New York and to what extent LA had arrived. Well, this year we're flipping the argument. It's like, oh no, LA's arrived. Do we really, did we really want that? So that, in short, is what the topic about is about today. I will say that I think what set us off, what might have set a number of us off in this room, was an article that appeared in the New York Times, and um, it was called Los Angeles and its booming creative class lures New Yorkers. And this article inferred that LA had arrived because Brooklyn hipsters now, quote, snap up brioche tarts at Proof Bakery in Atwater Village, visit gallery shows at Shepherd Ferry's <laughs> subliminal projects in Echo Park, or settle in over barrel-aged rye cocktails at Bar Stella in Silver Lake. And they scarcely realize they're more than a stroll away from a Karen Park, except for the 70-degree sunshine tickling their cheeks in February. <laughs> well, I used to write for the New York Times. Mallory and I know each other from back in the day when we both did, and I used to have my copy edited to put in snark, snark against LA. <laughs> so how times have changed. How times have changed, and you probably all remember, this article set people off. I will say it was one of several articles that were starting to appear saying, many of them in the New York Times, many of them in the New York Times style section, say essentially saying LA's arrived. The Parisians think it's great. Londoners think it's great. So her house is here. This gallery is open. This fashion house has just got to open in LA. And on the one hand, it's like, fantastic, we're a global city. We were laughed at for all these years. And on the other hand, it's like, ooh, is LA losing its sort of LA-ness, its weirdness? So anyway, that's what we're going to talk about. We'll run for about 30 minutes with our esteemed panel, and then we'll throw it open for comments. I am going to just quickly tell you who the esteemed panel is. Um, to my immediate right is Darren, who introduced himself. He is with the West Hollywood Design District. He is a retailer of note. He moved here in 1992 to go to Peter Stark Producing Program at USC. He worked in the film industry. He fa discovered a love for design and culture, a launched a clothing line called Alpha. It was a mainstay of the West Hollywood Design District. He now runs Alpha as a pop-up, and he works as a consultant. To Yes. <laughs> do, you do you want to have him consult? He can consult for you. I'm available. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Many of you in the community will know Christopher Farr to Darren's right. He's a painter and he's the founder of Christopher Farr, which deals in high-end rugs and fabrics. The, s the, the showroom, the business is based in LA, London, and New York. To his right, Many of you may have read the marvelous follow-up parody of that famous New York Times article. It was written by Anne Friedman, who's sitting here. The parody that appeared in the LA Times was called New York is a Livable Place. Who knew? <laughs> 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 when she's not writing really clever parodies of really annoying articles in the New York Times, she writes about gender, politics, technology, and culture, but we'll leave those topics for another time. She lives in LA. She's a weekly columnist for New York Magazine. She's also co-host of the podcast Call Your Girlfriend and the author of a popular email newsletter that you can subscribe to, and she'll give you the address to subscribe to at some point. Um, and then to Anne's right, we have Nicolas Libert, who was quoted in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> this is really about the New York Times. We need to <laughs> He was, quoted <laughs> he was quoted in the New York Times as saying of his adopted hometown, because Nicola lives here in downtown, he has a gallery of note called Please Do Not Enter. He and his cohorts 
famously had the Bates Motel painted white. I'm sure many of you saw that. It became an event. Um, anyway, he told the New York Times that 20 years ago, LA really wasn't the place. But now, it's a very energetic city. There's a kind of complete change in the perception of the city, not only in the art scene, but in the design and fashion scene. And we felt we really could add something to that momentum. So if Nicolas Lubert says LA has arrived, it's arrived. So anyway, we're going to start off. Darren promised some hand grenades. So Darren, I'm going to throw it to you. Oh, Lord, setting up some <laughs> expectations. Um, well, first of all, a couple caveats. Um, if Francis and I sort of responded to that New York Times article very strongly, and this sort of brought us to this panel, <laughs> and I have to say that usually if something appears in the New York Times style section, it's over, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I mean, usually by the time they write about it, especially about L.A., like, they're so off about LA all the time, as we know, and as, as you, you know, well documented. But that in and of itself to me is sort of like, okay, we're, we peaked because we're, we're now part of the New York Times style section. Um, another caveat, because I, I just have to say, is uh, part of our discussions with Frances is she told me that a lot of my feelings that I have about LA are just because I'm old. And that it no, would no, be, no. and that because I would feel that way anywhere, because as you get old, you realize that like all the things that you had done are sort of not appreciated anymore and no one pays attention. So. Well, I said we. We, are, yes. And yes. I didn't say old, I said we're getting older. Getting older, yeah, excuse me. Because yes. we arrived in the early 90s. You and yes. I arrived a year of each other. Yes. Even though we didn't meet until maybe four or five years ago, we, we lived the same LA experience. Exactly. So we had, now I'm going to, Bef can I just actually have yeah. Anne remind us of another New York Times article <laughs> <laughs> that was very interesting? <laughs> on A far better New York Times yeah. article um, <laughs> written. Oh, thank you. Written by a woman named Ada Calhoun, who has recently wrote a book about um, St. Mark's and about changing neighborhoods and the perception of coolness with within neighborhoods of New York. She made this point that um, everyone she interviewed thought that St. Mark's place as a neighborhood and culture. Um, had hit its peak in whatever they, whenever they were their coolest, youngest, hottest, etc. So people who were, you know, in their teens and 20s and the 80s were just like, it's never going to be the way it was in the 80s. And people who were teens in the 90s, same thing. Um, and so just this notion that our, how we define coolness is largely tied to how cool we felt or like whether we felt we were peaking or really a part of a movement. Um, you know, at that time, or whether that's over, is really personal. It relates more to personal story and perception, um, which is slightly different than the, the style section question of how do outsiders craft a narrative about your right. place. It's, that's more about how you feel about a place. So it's, it's slightly different. It is slightly different, but it, 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 it says more elegantly the point I was making about we're getting older, so LA <laughs> seems to have changed. But back to our topic at hand, and the sort of validation of LA externally in cities that used to kind of sneer at LA, you tell us why well, you're thinking I mean of moving to Tel Aviv. <laughs> that is true, that is true actually. <laughs> Tel Aviv is the new LA, or Berlin, or whatever you want to say. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, when I moved here 20 years mm -hmm. ago, I moved here to go to film school, and at that point, um, people that were moving here, and I'm gonna make a lot of generalizations, <laughs> so I just apologize in advance. People that were moving here were moving here for the film industry, a lot of people. and. When I moved here, it was very exotic to move here. No one that I went to high school or college with was moving here. Everyone was moving to the East Coast. And it felt there was something very scrappy and underground and interesting, and things were here to be discovered. And people would come visit, and it would be this surprise and delight of LA. And there was a lot going on back then that was very cool. And I just feel that now that this window has been opened onto all these things going on in LA, people are sort of acting like LA wasn't cool before, no <laughs> offense. Oh, but, you're feeling but, peak. But it was, but it, it actually has been cool for a long time. It's just now people are noticing it and people are putting a spotlight on that. And with that comes a certain expectation, comes sort of a more institutionalized uh, vision of everything. We're now, as opposed to being apples and oranges, we're more, you know, apples and apples. We're another global city that we're being compared to other global cities. And not that that's new either. None of this is new. It just feels that there's a new uh, look at it. And it's also um, a lot of the things, like in the fashion industry, for instance, because that's a big industry that people are saying, you know, is happening in LA now. I mean, I remember 15 years ago, 
uh, Jared Gold did a fashion show in Union Station, and he did a fashion show in an alley with bums. And you know, now they're like, ooh, Union Station, it's the cool place to do a fashion show. And I'm like, we've been doing fashion shows there for 20 years. It's like, just because you came from New York and decided it was cool doesn't mean that it is. And you know, we have, we have a lot of people, I have a lot of friends that, uh, as, the, as the New York Times article said, or as you said, would definitely be like, ugh, LA, there's no culture there, there's no nothing, it's awful. And now, all of a sudden, two years later, they just like flip the switch and like, we have to move to LA. And I know part of it is the winters and all that, but I always say to that too, like, I mean, I grew up in Michigan. Winters have been winters since forever. I mean, like, you know, that's, that's part of life in, in a different climate. But, you know, just because people from LA are come, from New York are coming here doesn't, to me, mean that it's cool. Like, we were already cool. We don't need you to tell us that we're cool. <laughs> but I think it's an issue, and we should jump to Christopher, because he, I know, has a, puts in a nutshell sort of what the transition, the transition that's happened here. But it's, but it's also a... a um, there's a, there's a change happening to the form of LA, the physical form, with the rise of downtown. All these things that I are, in, are really essentially very good things that are happening in LA. The increase of transit, the densification of um, centers, the, the, the emergence of downtown. One's feeling is, is this, this, this approval coming in from outside is, it's because LA is becoming like us. That's what's feeling annoying. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And one, mm. one other thing I just have to add. Sorry, you knew I would do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, on a very real note, I mean, the infrastructure of LA, I mean, we have a housing shortage and we have a major homeless problem. And we have, you know, there's all this fantasy of LA and more and more people are coming. And I don't know if anyone, you know, tried to drive down Melrose today and it took you 20 minutes to get from La Cienega. I mean, it's, there are real true infrastructure problems here that sort of people forget about when they're talking about all this greatness that's happening in LA. We have, a, you know, a lot of issues that need to be looked at. Yeah. Christopher. I'm yeah, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> speaking from a slightly different perspective. Um, I'm a victim of Cool Britannia from London, and that's what the press called London in the late 90s. And I arrived here in 2003 uh, with my wife and two boys, and we were here ostensibly for one year. And when I told people, um, my groovy, cool London friends, that I was going to live in Los Angeles, the sniggers and the smirks and the sneering that uh, was horrible. They couldn't even hide it. As British people are very good at hiding stuff like that. <laughs> you, know, you know, not even passive aggressive. It was like, why are you going to Los Angeles, Chris? And, and so I just thought, well, I've got to repost for this. I, I think I'm looking for a place that is vacuous and as shallow as I am. <laughs> so I, I kind of was looking for the perfect match. And, I looked at the, my global map and I thought, well, Los Angeles is obviously the place to go. And, and that shut them up because I kind of beat them to the punch. <laughs> I thought, because that's what you're thinking. You're thinking it's a, a know-nothing kind of place. It's Hollywood. It's entertainment. It's the beach. It's surfing. That's about it. And so, so I arrived and I'm still here 12 years later, like every other sad Englishman. You know, it was like, um, <laughs> what? Sun, mountains, beach, a studio where I could work. And so, yeah, it was, it was very, it was, and I have seen, I have to say, there is a quantifiable difference between 2003 and where we are right now. It was a place where you could escape, where you could find cheap rents, where you could get a, a really cool studio. And I've seen the emergence and growth of it in the same way that when I had my gallery in, Los, in uh, Notting Hill Gate in London, I was there before it became cool. And suddenly when the press says it's cool, as Darren says, it's over. And, and, and what over means in, um, in pragmatic terms is the fashion industry moves in. Paul, <laughs> Paul Smith, Joseph, we knew then when they started moving next to us, we were going to be out of there and we we're going to have a huge payday when we sold our lease on. And we did. So there, there are, there, we really are at that place now. And, and in a way, it's like, yeah, the rag trade is, is the first to get there. They're very quick on the uptake. So, Nicola... I think you also referred, Chris, Christopher, to the, to the Chelsea Gallery system. Don't mind. You yeah. Said, yeah, and yeah, yeah. you said that well, was yeah, a I definer of a city moving into a different place. I, yes, I, I think that's a good point. I think it's, it's quite well known that once, I mean, I think the artists in Los Angeles have become quite important now, and uh, not that they weren't before, but they, and they were having shows here without their New York and London dealers. They were with local uh, gallerists, and therefore, Matthew Marks and the gang, and now Ewan Worth moved here. Um, 
they're not having that, and they're not having their artist uh, being taken away from them, so they have to show here. And it's kind of impressive how they've, they don't mess mm -hmm. around. I mean, fashion and art, absolutely. So yeah, th those are all the endorsements that, that signal this change in Los Angeles. And, and I'm not against change. I think LA's growing up, it's a cool place, and it's become a major metropolis, you know, an important place. And I'm no longer sneered at. I mean, now people ring me up from London and say, Chris, how do I get a green card, you know? <laughs> And I, and I remind them of their contempt for me uh, 12 years previously, and I put the phone down. <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you have come straight into the heart of the new Los Angeles downtown, and you are part of the new Los Angeles. From well. Paris, which used to definitely lead the world in mocking L.A. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to hear that the new uh, Los Angeles is downtown. Nobody agrees on that, <laughs> but it's good news. Uh, no, beside that, uh, I would just try to react to uh, what I've heard so far. <laughs> um, it seems that the temperature is given by the New York Times. <laughs> and that's pretty funny because <laughs> this is the only thing you are just talking about. <laughs> just if the only... Yeah, God will is in New York for you <laughs> in your mind. And that's something really surprising <laughs> because since you should exist by yourself, since you think it's, <laughs> no, but it's, it's really surprising because nobody talked about the LA Times and, and we no, know. No, we have, I've talked about Anne Friedman. Yeah, but, and yeah. <laughs> but we know also what you think of the LA Times most of the time, <laughs> so it's, <laughs> It's about, you know, this funny game, uh, how you, <laughs> how do you say that in English? You denigrate, is that right? Uh, yourself or your, your scene, and at the same time, you feel like you're really happy to have these New York Times stories, but at the same time, you feel like it's a kind of dangerous game for you and for us <laughs> and for everything. <laughs> so what I think is that there is a price for everything, and if you want to be on the radar in the fashion scene, in the art scene, in everything. If you want to be a metropolis, then you have to pay for it. And pay for it is, of course, a money issue, but it's not only about that. It's losing several things and losing maybe quality of life, maybe several things, low rents, all these things, but you can't wish something really trendy and, and, and and crazy and, and funny and busy, and at the same time just looking for anything, a quiet neighborhood and, and everything like that. It's just like the people who are in their neighborhood asking for more shops, for more, uh, and at the same time they ask for a Starbucks. But what is a Starbucks? Uh, it's nothing like a coffee place, but they want it and they don't want it. We have a big debate right now downtown whether the Apple store will be in the landmark building or not. And you can see how many people are riding on that <laughs> because they all want the Apple store, but they don't want downtown to change. So what do we do now? What do you think? What do what you think? Coming I from Paris, which has gone through its own changes. So my, my story, I, I want just to, set somethi to say something. Uh, we came 20 years ago. We did not understand the city because when you come here for the very first time as a tourist you don't get the story and LA is very very difficult to understand you need the keys and if someone which is usually a local guy doesn't give you the keys you will just leave the city without any understanding of it and it takes time it takes I would say in in investment uh, and it's, it takes probably a kind of a small network to understand that city. And that's really something important and that makes a huge difference. If you go to New York, you immediately understand. You like it or not, but you understand what it's about. And, but Los Angeles is so different for that. And you say weird, it may be weird, it may be different, but at least it has its, its own DNA, I would say. Uh, but this DNA is, is slightly evolving, is slightly changing now. And you talked about something which is some f something really important for me, density. Density which is linked to the, or related to the urban spirit. Urban spirit has been exactly the opposite of what 
LA was supposed to be for the past 50 years. Uh, not for the beginning, because the beginning, it was downtown LA, and it was about density, it was about Broadway, it was about the best transportation network in, the, in, the, in, in America. It was all these, it was a city, nothing, le nothing else. But then it's, it started moving on the west side, and it started changing completely. And everybody was trying to forget and to deny this urban spirit, because we, or they wanted, the, the swimming pool, the house, the countryside, the mountains, the beach, and everything like that. This LA quality of, well, lifestyle, which is something I can easily understand because it's, it's just a paradise here. But at the same time, this city was completely forgotten. And when we moved here two years ago, it was a ghost city. I mean, it was the beginning of the restoration, the renovation, the renaissance, but when we, when we came back um, three years ago, when we just arrived downtown, we were fascinated by this empty city with all this architecture. It's probably the best example you could think of in the United States of a preserved old urban city, really. Um, and the urban spirit goes with it. it. It can be there. You just have to awake it. And that's what's happening now. So are we ready here in LA to have this urban spirit? Are we ready to be a real big city like New York, like Paris, like London? That's probably the issue, but do we really have to choose? Because we can go on the west side, we can go in the mountains. I know if you drive one hour from the center of downtown, you'll be in, in a completely different neighborhood. You'll be five miles away. <laughs> <laughs> so Darren. Let me, let me invite you to Paris. <laughs> and let me share with you that experience of the traffic. And then you'll see what a real nightmare is. Yeah. And that's something also really interesting. I shouldn't be bad, but you know I'm French. Uh -oh. <laughs> when, when, we were, when we started the Please Do Not Enter Created Store, we were on the top floor of a historical building. And we thought that idea of a special destination, well-kept secret, was a, was a really funny idea. And it would match our idea of exclusive pieces, really limited special installation, special production, special projects. And then we had the people saying, my God, going to downtown is such a nightmare. And when do, where do we park? Well, you can park in the building <laughs> or opposite to the building, there's a public parking, and um, even in front of the building, there is some uh, um, meters. Uh, meters, and that's the three options you have. Uh, yes, but it's, I don't know downtown, it's so, it's so difficult to, to drive downtown, so it's not a parking issue, okay. Um, when are you opening? Well, we open every day, and you can go from 11 in the morning to 7, so you can go really when it's really quiet in the traffic. No, but it's, it's, it's really a problem. So it's not a problem. If you travel in Paris, if you drive in Paris, whatever time you may drive, you will get into real trouble, and you can believe me. But you'll be excited to reach that last, I mean, last top floor and that special hidden destination. Here, we are a little like spoiled childs. And everything has to be so easy, like going to the beach, like going to everywhere, easily driving, parking, but it's really easy here. Go to everywhere outside, in Europe especially. Try to park in, in Rome. Have you, have you done that before? <laughs> Go for it, and then you'll, be, you'll come back, you'll come back as a, as a real LA guy saying, how positive, how amazing it is here in LA. Yes. 20 years ago, it was really easy to yeah. park and drive around. 20 okay. years ago. But you know, the New York Times said Rome has changed. <laughs> so, so um, I, want, I want to bring Anne in, because she has many very interesting thoughts on this. But the fact that you brought up the New York Times and the kind of being wedded to what the New York Times sort of thinks of us is terribly funny. And which is a great segue to Anne, because you took this on as a media story, didn't you, in terms of your parody, and as, as well as this analysis of how LA is changing? 
like most people in this room, I read that style section article and uh, rolled my eyes so hard they fell out of my head. <laughs> and uh, and then I, I occasionally write for the op-ed page at the Los Angeles Times. And my editor there said, I think you should respond to this because she's a great editor. And what if you wrote a parody? So I can't take credit for that original idea. But I will say that the notion that something does not exist until New York discovers it or until London discovers it um, is exactly what I was taking aim at. And that paragraph that you read about um, people buying their pastries at Proof and not even missing Prospect Park or whatever. I mean, I just randomly Googled popular pastry spot in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and you know, sort of supplemented um, uh, my own knowledge of New York with, with like, oh, my LA experience um, would look like this in New York. Uh, it's funny because um, I actually have no, I mean, I, I love living in Los Angeles and I identify as an Angelino. I also, I like visiting New York for work purposes and understand why people would enjoy living there. I don't actually think that, I, I think it is still an apples to oranges situation. I don't think it's ever going to be apples to apples for geographic reasons, for you know structural <laughs> reasons, for weather reasons, for all this stuff that no amount of fashion industry investment um, can change. And, uh, and I, I do think that um, the things that uh, were listed in that article, for example, have been here for a really long time. It's just, you know, that th it was actually, and to be fair to that article a little bit, it was about New Yorkers discovering out Los Angeles. It wasn't, this is all new in Los Angeles. And so um, I have a little bit of sympathy <laughs> for the style section editors. <laughs> <laughs> that was a tone. I mean... As I say, just to sort of repeat myself, I, I, I used to write for the New York Times about back in the 90s, and, and really my copy would be edited. They would put, the sub-editors would put it, they would rewrite sentences to give it a tone that was slightly hostile to LA, even as, uh, even as they wanted, like, as they, they were just omnivorous for articles about LA, and then would, then would edit, the, edit in the snark. But, um, but, but, I, sh I should just bring up one thing. We, the one person that we don't have represented on this panel is the person, and I actually live with one of them, who is a New Yorker who now is out here, and he still will say, this is a podunk place. <laughs> For everybody who says culture's arrived, fashion's arrived, art has arrived, the museums are great, at last we've got thinking, sophisticated people, he'll say, we haven't. It's still... <laughs> Here's so. what I say to those people, the internet. <laughs> well, I mean, like you can find whatever you want. If you're not getting it locally, you can find it. I do also know a number of people that did move here from New York and have moved back. I mean, it's sort of like what Nicola is saying. It, it's, it's, a, it's a weird place. It's just, it's a different place and it does take some, coming here as a tourist or even coming here from New York to do work and be here for small periods of time is different than, than living here. And I think people realize that when they actually move here. And I do know some of those sort of fashion people that moved here and they, it just wasn't right for them. So where are we? Nikolai, you really do have a kind of long, you've, 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 you're the, the most recent from, from the furthest away place in a way. Where do you think, where, I, guess I, I guess the question would be, given the trajectory that LA seems to be on, which is sort of zooming upwards, do you see it as on an upward trajectory? I mean, I am hearing rumblings about, of, of companies moving into downtown and then actually finding that it's not quite arrived in the way that reports suggest and that it is more tricky. And It is, it is really tricky because if you go downtown today, it's, it's not done. I mean, there is lots of things to achieve before being able to call it a, a real city center and, and to have a real quality of life. But this is probably the most interesting time because this is the exact moment where the transition is happening. And it's, it's really the, the link between the past, which is really incredible because this past has been so, so difficult, so painful, so hard, and, and in the memory of lots of people, generation, it's so strong. It's pretty unusual. And it's the link between that past and the future. And Los Angeles has always been looking forward. And that's really something amazing about the city. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons why we moved here, 
because you don't have so many questions in mind. You don't try to know who are the people in front of you. You don't try to get their, their bio or their pedigree or whatever. You just are open-minded and curious, and that's all. And that's an amazing quality. And, and people in LA have that quality. And probably because they are far from Europe, probably because, but in a good way, I mean, it's really positive what I say. And when we arrived here, we had such an amazing welcome that you, you couldn't think of that kind of welcome in Paris and even in Europe. And, and we've been here for 18 months and, and that's a real everyday pleasure. What we've done on Sunset with that abandoned motel which has been closed for 20 years and that Vincent Lamoureux painted in white could only exist in LA. It couldn't exist anywhere in the world because we were just dealing with this Californian dream, with these LA ingredients that we all have in mind. People who live in LA and love them, but also people from the industry and people from all over the world. And this is, this is the mix that we have to deal with. People um, uh, in the world have st such a strong idea about LA. Everybody knows LA without coming here. And who, what city could you think of like this? Everybody have heard of Beverly Hills, Bel Air, Malibu, Santa Monica. All these things are really important. West Hollywood. It's, it's part of, <laughs> sorry about that. It's, it's part of everybody's minds. And Sunset Boulevard is an address that everybody in the world knows. And, and the palm trees and the sea, the ocean, everything is really strong. So you don't even know have to, to travel here to, to love LA. And that's pretty unusual. But when you come here, you have to match it. You have to accept it. You have to, to, to understand it. And, and that's a kind of uh, investment that you have. But if you do it, and if you go and take time to do it, then the reward is there. And then you, you, won't, you won't move anymore. You really want to be here. Even if it's changing, if it's, if, it's, if it's going to the future, a future that may be afraid of, you may be afraid of, but that's something really amazing. Darren, are you going to hold back on your plans to move to Tel Aviv? <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that, but I, I will say I sort of agree. I mean, Nicola sort of nailed it when he said um, there's a price to pay. I mean, we're, we're making great changes, and, you know, and I, I mean all the joking aside, like LA is a great place and there, you know, there are great things happening here. But as you said, I think that the bottom line is to be that city, there are prices to pay and not, that's just a reality. And I don't know if that's good or bad or it's some of both. And some people may want to pay those prices and other people may not. But I think that at the end of the day, as we move forward and as we become the city of the future that we're becoming, there, there are prices to pay. And that, that's sort of the bottom line for me. And I don't know. I have to make my own decision right. whether I want to pay those prices or not. But, but as in financial price as well as yeah, definitely. Change, that's of, definitely. change of relationship yes, to the an, city. Exactly. But this area, more than um, the so-called traditional city, is seeing a physical change that is kind of... That, 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 is, that is creating some sense of disequilibrium, you know, as the place changes and the transit changes and people's sort of relationship to the physical environment. So anyway, we have um, a few minutes left, so let's throw it open to a question. What is new and what's next? Have you, do you have a sense? Well, of I mean, for example, you know, uh, you see someone like Roy Choi who is constantly reinventing anything. And, uh, and it's exciting to watch people like that. That the food is changing and then it, it comes up all over the world, what mm -hmm. we have decided is. But even the traffic is going to push people into those metros because of, or on the bicycle. Uh, 
Beverly Hills getting a bike 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 share program. So it's West Hollywood. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Santa Monica just got theirs. <laughs> but those th th that is change. My but my colleague and um, producer Avishai Artsy and I just covered that the other day. And um, the bike share program is a signifier of a, a change coming to the sort of the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of LA as as well as the physical place. But um, Sorry to call LA weird. <laughs> no, I, I, because it, it, no, I, don't, I never even thought of it ever yeah. that way because it was normal. It was normal that these different kinds of people did things together a different way. And of course, uh, if you think that it's just getting sort of a, losing its momentum, just wait till the next earthquake. I know. <laughs> That's the big change. That is the big change. The earthquake was a defining experience for people who arrived before the 90s or before the previous, what, the seven, one in the 70s. There's a whole generation that hasn't lived through an earthquake, and that's... Right. <laughs> Here we go. Question. <laughs> I think you're perfectly right because um, um, for all kind of reasons, but the first reason is that there is so many different uh, nationalities, languages, uh, and all these people living together. And we have really communities, really strong communities uh, all around spread in LA, uh, but they all share one common dream, which is not only the American dream, there is a kind of special LA dream, and they have something in common. They may be completely different, but they have something in common. And sometimes in Paris, we miss that. We don't have that much, that common spirit. And that's one of, one of the reasons why we're fascinated and really excited about LA now, coming what? from Paris. What's that common spirit? That's pretty hard to define, but that's that contradiction that we were mentioning earlier, that idea of having uh, a huge potential uh, in business, for example, and you come with your own dreams. For people, Some people come for the industry, other people come for the fashion, and there is still lots to do in the fashion industry in LA, and some people come from the art scene or for all kind of businesses but you feel that you can make business here. And at the same time, you have that idea of quality of life, this LA quality of life, and you want to mix them together. And sometimes you can't mix them together because, again, you have a price to pay. And you realize that you want completely different things, but everybody believes that this could be possible here in that space. And when you see these people coming from the East Coast, coming from New York, uh, going through a kind of a burnout, and, and just, you know, <laughs> crawling here and, and <laughs> trying to find a kind of rest or new life. And that's exactly what it's about. And, and you don't have that spirit in New York, I think. Yes, um, thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed the uh, discussion. Um, I don't read the New York Times, so I want to make that clear. <laughs> I don't need anybody's approval to say that my work is cool. I but do it, and then um, you get the idea. Yeah. That's too, why do we need approval? But, well, you're and right. The social media has lumped it. Now you're on Facebook. Everybody's on Facebook trying to look ultra fabulous. And so that's a new sort of twist to it all. So Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think yeah. Mallory has to apologize for this. Um, really. <laughs> Mallory, because <laughs> yeah. she's written about LA and Paris Vogue. Well, I think so. And, and call, you know, this whole 
<laughs> bogus discussion about LA Cool or is it or isn't it? Who cares? I mean, we don't really, <laughs> none of us really care. Um, we're very happy here. I'm slightly pissed off that the world's moving here because it's my own little private playground, Los Angeles. And, you know, I was very happy when everybody sneered at it because, you know, no one wanted to come. Well, and, and now everybody wants to be here. Which, so, yeah. which has an effect on the rents. And it has an effect Always. on the real estate. Yes, that's what and happened so, in Notting Hill Gate. Right, and so what people are anxious about is that essential creativity that Nicola's referring to, which really was made possible by affordable places to create, yes. that that piece is disappearing. So well, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I think um, when uh, your boyfriend's so wrong, or husband, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> not that you didn't know that already, but on, <laughs> It's, it's like, <laughs> come on. Um, L.A. is full of brilliant people, actually. And I really mean that. You know, I've come from sn snobby old London and where they all think they're God Almighty. But here, there really are very bright writers, uh, creative artists, everything you can think of. Um, and, and it's quite private. It's a very private city. And as an Englishman, I kind of relate to that because there's all these little fiefdoms, these little private sort of clubs everywhere, which you don't know about unless you live here for 10 years. Sitting right next to you is one of LA's creative writers who's sitting at really? home writing oh, right. and who also came here recently. And it is true that LA absolutely is full of brilliant people. That, that's why I'm sure all of us in this room love this place. However, there's a real conversation happening along the lines of, should I move to Detroit? Should I move to St. Louis? I can't afford to stay here anymore. When you have people like Darren seriously thinking of moving, what's going on? But then, me, no, he won't ever really go. But he likes to have the conversation. So, Anne, over to you. Well, I do think that housing prices and rent are an important piece of this. I mean, I, um, I always wonder when someone says, oh, we're going to be great, is it because you own? <laughs> um, is it because you own your house? I rent, you know, I don't know. Um, I have a, one of my good friends lives in Kansas City and is shopping for houses and it's just jaw dropping, right? Or like 75,000 for a house or something. I mean, I, I don't want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, and I understand, um, I understand that most global cities, which I think Los Angeles has been a global city for a long time. This is not a past five years or since the New York Times said so phenomenon. I have, even before I lived here, considered it a global city. Um, that's true. But I do think this point about um, writers or people who do creative work that's not tied to the film and entertainment industry is an important one. Um, that in a sense, uh, and for me anyway, it's, it's really just been the internet that's enabled me to live here. I mean, my, I work for an industry that's centered um, you know, in New York and to a slightly lesser extent London, and all of my editors are in those two cities, and um, at a, in a different time I maybe could have made a living here if I were covering the entertainment industry, but now I'm at a point where those editors want me to write about people doing all kinds of things here. And, um, and so I, I, I do think that, um, I don't know, those are two really unrelated thoughts about housing prices and, and being a writer and whatnot, but, um, but that, that sort of aspect of um, change opening the door for this city to be known for the other great things that have been happening here for a long time, um, I think is positive. It's a great way to end. We've got a, we've got a call. We, oh, I'm so sorry. There's more questions to be had, but we have to m move to the next great panel that's going to be hosted by Mallory um, at Woven Accents, which is just a few yards down the road. West Hollywood being a very walkable neighborhood. Just <laughs> <laughs> and there will be bike share. When is bike share coming to West Hollywood? <laughs> when is? April. 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 Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to Nicola and Chris Darren.